I'm coming to you today from the University of Southern California, home of the Center for Inclusive Democracy. Joining me is the center's founder and director, Dr. Mindy Romero. Mindy is a sociologist whose research examines race and ethnicity in the context of political behavior, and she's working to understand and explain voting patterns and political underrepresentation. Since we're in the early stages of the 2024 U.S. election cycle, and this is a presidential election year, this is the first episode in a series I'm going to be doing around the science of elections and democracy. We absolutely need to use the evidence and data that we collect to inform our democratic processes, and Mindy is on the front lines of analyzing and interpreting election science. So thank you so much for being here, and if you could start by giving us um, a general overview of what the science of elections is all about. Oh, wow. Um, well, first off, happy to be here. Thank you for having me. And thank you for doing this series. That's really exciting and important. Um, I would say that you know, the science of elections really is really the exploration, the better understanding of how our elections, how the election system in the United States actually functions, um, really anything from do they turn out, like we probably yeah. often think of when we think about elections, uh, to uh, different methods of voting, um, what the voter experience is, um, all the way to really you kind know, of the back behind the scenes end of things when it comes to how the election is administered, right, by an election official. So um, the process for how you set up a polling rights or a vote center, mm. understanding the science behind the flow and efficiency and how to get people out and in and, um, you know, auditing uh, of the election results, right? Yeah, and, and a lot of that's things that we don't always think of. A lot of things that we don't think about. Uh -huh. uh, really, anything that falls under that could be something that isn't necessarily about the administration of the election, but it could be about how election officials are experiencing their job, like in recent years, um, <laughs> threats right, to right. election officials, um, how that impacts them, how it impacts their work, the public perception of the how of election officials themselves, but also uh, whether people trust elections, how can we increase trust, how does that impact things like um, accepting the results of an election? Wow. Okay, so it's, 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 pretty, it's pretty broad. And, and it's incredibly important, I would say increasingly important in light of everything that's happened in the last few years. Um, but I'm an 80s kid, like no, no lie there, I just aged myself. Um, but I can remember hearing general like get out the vote campaigns, um, all the messaging since I was in elementary school. So like late 80s era. And then of course, um, back then the names were like Dukakis and Quail and <laughs> things we don't hear anymore. Um, but I remember when Rock the Vote came out in the 90s, um, and then I've seen their booths at concerts I've gone to, you know, in the 90s and, and into this decade. Yeah. So why do we need all of this? Like, why does the United States have such a hard time getting people to the polls? Well, I think just understanding that, which most people don't, right? <laughs> um, and seeing that as a negative. Mm. So we're a democracy, for all intents and purposes, but we're not a representative of democracy. You've done a number of things over the last hundred years or so, right, to um, try to get us closer to that, but we're nowhere near that. Mm -hmm. So in any given election, whether it's a presidential, a midterm, a general, a primary, um, one thing you can count on, whether it's high turnout or low turnout, is that the people who are actually casting a ballot, mm -hmm. that pie of voters, is not going to be representative of the rest of the country. Of, of other of the total pie of eligible voters, right? right? The adult citizens of the United States. It's going to be older, um, more likely to be white. It's going to be wealthier, um, uh, you know, home buying status, um, and so forth. And it there are differences in terms of policy preferences as well. So of course, it's supposed to be a democracy where those that we represent, public democracy, but those that represent us, um, those that are elected, right, to represent us should be hearing from all of the, their constituents, right? All that they represent should know the full needs, wants, desires, interests. Mm -hmm. And the reality is not <laughs> everybody's making the decision, right, to select those representatives of a given district. Um, so first off, we're not representing, not everybody thinks that's a bad thing. Not everybody thinks we should be a fully representative democracy. Not yeah. everyone, some of it's, or a lot of it's politics. Yes. Perceptions around, well, if you help these groups vote more, young people, for instance, mm -hmm. right? Do I really want young people to be making decisions, right, for my pocketbook? And um, 
But beyond kind of the politics, there's just a lot of uh, assumptions around kind of just who's worthy of participating in the United States. We all, we long have had uh, barriers not only to participation, but um, tests for whether people should be, should have the right to vote. Right. And a lot of that is also politically motivated. Of course, there are excuses, right? We um, think about literacy tests and um, whether you hold land and right. so forth, right? Um, but... But, you know, I think if you talk to a lot of people, they like the fact that we have a democracy. People like the idea of it. But when it really comes to push, you know, push comes to shove, if you will, and not everybody believes the basic assumption that it should be a representative. So, um, so that's one thing. Sorry, that was a long answer. No, it's but, great. I uh, love, I love long and thorough answers. Okay. That was excellent. Um, but to really address your question, so, not everybody's voting, first off. We have to reach those people that aren't voting. We know there are lots of barriers historically and still today for why people don't mm-hmm. participate. It's not like people are just, you know, checking out and don't want to, you know, there's always some people that are apathetic, but by and large, I've seen in my own research, and, and we know this in the field, that most people who are not participating, there's real reasons why they're not participating, yeah. right? Um, there's barriers kind of institutionally that make it harder for them to participate, but there's also motivational barriers. People feel less connected or they feel disconnected from the political process. Mm. They care very much about their communities. They care very much about, uh, you know, uh, at least in the in the concept of election officials and what they're going to do for their communities and their mm. lives. Um, but they don't see how m- making a vote, right, yeah. actually casting a vote, um, will get them there. Right. Um, and there's a lot of um, skepticism mm-hmm. um, around our political electoral process, around our elected officials. Um, and we also have an electoral system that, ex- that, aside from the rules and regulations that we know, right, that are present, right, that make it harder for people, um, we have an electoral system that doesn't engage typically with historically underrepresented groups. Oh, that's for sure. So we get really this kind of vicious cycle mm-hmm. where... Um, people don't get the outreach and engagement from elect- uh, from campaigns and candidates, so then they don't turn out. And then, yeah. So most of campaigns and candidates, um, they're they're doing the vast majority of outreach and voter education in our system. It's not election officials, it's not nonprofits, although they do great work. It's the bulk of the money, time, and attention is from candidates and campaigns. Yeah. They're not trying to get everybody out to their own. No, we're <laughs> trying to get those that they need and probably just what they need. And so they're using typically, always exceptions, a likely voter model. Yeah. And that likely voter model means that they are targeting those people already highest, most likely to vote. By mm-hmm. definition, they're gonna be less likely to target historically underrepresented groups. And you can have people that are even registered to vote. We have lots of survey research that shows us that election after election, um, that groups that are less likely to vote are less likely to get that outreach and mobilization. Yeah. And therefore, Right, less information, less urgency to yeah. participate, and the vicious cycle continues. So, why do we need rock the vote? Because <laughs> we need alternatives to that, right? Oh. We need all that we can get when it comes to nonpartisan activities to reach out to make the case for voting, to start to change some of those numbers. We've seen a lot of good work over the last few decades. Yeah, yeah. And um, unfortunately, we still have tremendous disparities in turnout and. We have a electorate that is still very underrepresented, so we need much more. Yeah, I mean, it, there's a real urgency there, and it's sort of a, it's a brutal efficiency. It's, you know, who is going to come out and vote for us? We're going to invest in them. I mean, that's what campaigns do. You're, you've nailed it. Um, and so, I mean, I wanted to talk a little bit about a, like a more recent effort, which got a lot of publicity. Mm-hmm. Um, so in 2018, Stacey Abrams, a uh, former member of the Georgia House of Representatives, and she had run for higher office in Georgia yeah. for governor. Um, she actually, because of worries about voter suppression, she started Fair Fight Action, and that was designed yeah. to combat voter suppression. So is active voter suppression, is that a big issue that we see today? It is still very yeah. much. Yeah. So it really depends on how you want to define it. Can we quantify it? Is there... Is that, like, how would you define it, kind of? Yeah, well, I think there's the, in the law, right? Mm-hmm. Um, so what are what are the election policies in a given jurisdiction, typically at the state level, um, that make it harder or easier? And are those policies designed in a way that dis- disproportionately negatively impact some populations more than others, right? Okay. Is, it, is it just something that makes it harder for, like, registration? Makes it harder for everybody mm-hmm. to register? Or is it does it target 
disproportionately some groups more than others, right? Okay. And in Georgia, right, lots of conversation mm-hmm. around changes in election policy okay. um, designed, right, mm-hmm. um, to make it hard for black communities to know. Yes. For instance, right? So it was talked a lot about that. Um, so there's kind of what's in the law. And then there's maybe more subtle forms of voter suppression that um, it's harder for people to kind of wrap their brains around. And when they think about like, oh, do we have voter suppression in California? No. Do we have voter mm-hmm. suppression across the United States? But we have, I would argue, culturally, okay, we have um, many aspects of who we are as a nation that in a broader definition, right, um, is a form of voter suppression. Wow. Okay. Um, and then we have kind of everything in between, between the kind of what's in the law specifically and kind of the cultural kind of ethos. We have um, how does our electoral system and the way that it's designed serve to suppress the vote? Okay. okay. Yeah. Just flaws inherent in the system. Well, we have a two-party winner-take-all system, right? Um, Single-member districts. Uh, one of the biz- biggest predictors of turnout period mm-hmm. um, almost across election types is whether it's competitive. Okay. 2020, we saw historically um, high turnout, a record turnout 2020. Why? Because it was an incredibly competitive presidential year, right? Yeah. Yeah. Um, <laughs> So, uh, but the way our system here in the United States is designed, it really, is, most districts across the United States, at least congressionally, let's just take congressional districts, you've got the power of incumbency, you, you have safe districts, and you don't have people feeling like there's a lot at stake for why they should participate unless you're really a diehard voter. And campaigns and candidates probably aren't going to spend a lot of money. You may not even have an opponent if you're an incumbent. Right. You have an incumbent. Maybe it's a cakewalk, and you're not going to put a lot of money into that outreach, and some people don't even hear that there's knowledge, oh. right? That's just one example. I know. It's just oh, it, it's it's so painful. <laughs> so, and there's much more that we could talk about. That's a good yeah. example. We're just a competitive step of, of an election based on our system that we've designed. Um, and so what that does is that disproportionate. It's the diehard voters. Yeah. Demographically. They're so already engaged. And demographically skewed in one way, right? And policy skewed as well. Um, and kind of everybody else that doesn't get to participate, mm-hmm. right? And then make, some of those voters will come out in the primary, but they're voting on a um, ballot that has been selected by a very underrepresented, right, small group of, of the population. And then I mentioned culturally, and that kind of, I know, I saw a look there for a moment. Like, um, <laughs> we have a culture in the United States where it's completely acceptable not to vote. Right. It really is. It, and it's shocking because not every country is like that. I lived in Australia for a few years and it's mandatory. So yeah, block, everybody votes. Election night of the block night. Block, yes. block party night, I should say, right? Hey, yeah. uh, people celebrate that. It's fun. Um, so, yeah, in the United States, uh, there really isn't pressure. I think things are starting mm-hmm. to change in the last couple of election cycles for some folks. Um, we're seeing more signs and events. Um, celebrities come out. A lot of that, though, is politically skewed in one direction or another, <laughs> which I respect whatever you know, yeah. people want to fight for, of course. Um, and engagement is engagement, but we'd love to see more nonpartisan. Just come mm-hmm. out to vote because it's important to vote. Yeah, because we all should. <laughs> yeah. yeah. So, But we are seeing more of that, too, yeah. uh, more than nonpartisan. And here on this campus at USC, the efforts for uh, engaging young people to participate have really grown over the last, the last few years. So college campuses across the United States, I'd like to see when we talk about young people, we're targeting off uh, campus, yeah. on and off campus. Yeah, um, not everyone goes to college. Yeah, mm-hmm. non-college going youth. Um, so our youth vote is, is uh, smaller than older voters. We have you know smaller turnout rates for young voters than compared to 65 plus, for instance. But if you look at the youth vote, those who are participating, it is skewed more, we're more likely if you're college going, well, your background, you know, all that kind of stuff, right? So use of color, low income, you're even less represented. I wanted but, to ask about but, that. Yeah. Um, and, and we can come back to that too, but I, I was just going to say that, um, so culturally, especially for young people, young people are, are not expected to participate. Sometimes they're actively discouraged, yeah. right? I don't, you know, I don't want you to, I want you to focus on what you're focusing. You don't need to vote if you're, you know, I've heard parents yeah. say, oh, that. you don't own a house. You don't, you know, yeah. you don't care about social security, or whatever. Just, but sometimes parents don't. Yeah. I've heard, sir, you know, I don't, I don't want you to get jury duty. I've heard students tell me their parents have told them that. Um, wow. So, and then just generally speaking, you know, we're a very ageist society. It's yeah. one of the last kind of open um, uh, areas of discrimination that we, we just don't, right? We, yeah. It's a great point. We, yeah, we openly and news media, uh, really all aspects of our culture, you can um, disparage young people. 
right? Yeah. Millennial, those Gen Zers, oh, yeah. I don't know how to work, you know, what's mm-hmm. going on with them? You know, the avocado toast yeah, uh, trope. <laughs> and, you know, um, we don't do a lot to support young people in voting. Um, when they do, we question it. And when they don't, we blame them for it. Or we say, you know, what's wrong with these young people, right? So so that yeah. it's really obvious when we look at age. It's less obvious when we look at other categories. Okay. But I would say certainly we have a culture that in many states, for instance, you have to you, know, you, know, you have to take it off from work to vote. Yeah. You, know, you can lose money, right? Not in California, but you lose income. Um, there are in recent times a political pressure around whether you're going to vote. I'm sorry, how you're going to vote, yes. if you are going to vote. Um, and for the average person, there isn't, um, it, again, it's harder to make that kind of connection to why it matters for them to participate. And they maybe see a lot of negative. Yeah. Um, so anyway, that, that gives you kind of a really broad spectrum of how to think about it. But do we have still very overt, maybe more traditionally defined mm-hmm. uh, types of voter suppression that happening in the United States where people go to the polling place and they get yeah, intimidated. Yeah. yeah. To, um, Those things of course still happen as well. Yeah. But just as with many things in our history, right, in our culture, um, anytime that you don't have to pull out that very obvious uh, violent card. <laughs> yes. And you suppress by um, having people self select out of mm-hmm. participating. Yeah. That's insidious. It's insidious. Um, and what you do is you end up, um, creating an electorate that seems to self-select, okay. doesn't care, gets blamed for their lack of participation. Mm-hmm. Those used today, the Latino, the, the giant, whatever it might be. Um, and instead of us questioning why the system, right, discourages people. It's like it ticks our confirmation bias and then we just go about our business. Yeah. I mean, yeah, we, we do nothing to prepare young people to participate in our election. Um, we have an abysmal, generally speaking, always good exceptions, but abysmal sympathetic sort of education system. Yeah. Um, <laughs> campaigns and campaigns don't reach out to young people. Others don't. We have a culture that discourages them from participating. Um, they don't get to practice it very well or very much. You know, the yeah. idea of democracy in schools, again, some good exceptions, good teachers, of course, but then they turn 18, they don't vote. And when they don't vote, we, we, we rag we, on them. <laughs> yeah, we blame them for it. We magically expected them both to know how to vote, want to vote, mm-hmm. and when they don't, we blame them. Yeah. Um, that's just it's just kind of really obvious when we think about young people and that kind of dynamic that we it's really present everywhere. It's a war to blame the group that is suppressed. Yeah. Um, so we don't question our larger system. I mean, that's that's perpetuate. Yeah, it, we're, we are just allowing the cycle to continue and. I love that you framed it as ageism because that is so, it's poignant. It's true. I mean, it, you can, you can, you can kick the next generation below you all you want. I mean, that's how it works and that's not right. So, okay. You are obviously a contrast to that dynamic of the unengaged, uninformed person. Cause you took a path from when you were younger yes. to lead you to this, yes. where you are an expert on voting and patterns and who's represented and who isn't. So, what drove you to study this? And then what's fueling you now? That's a good question. <laughs> um, so when I was a kid, I, you know, I think it all comes down to fairness, like kind of what's in your gut. And you think about when you're young, right, fairness is a big deal, right? Yeah. You know, my brother took my candy bar, my, right, whatever. <laughs> um, and when I was a kid, I was in a community that had a lot of by ten typical measures of social economic outcomes, wasn't doing very well, right? Mm-hmm. And I remember not knowing anything about our political system, of course, um, just thinking like, well, why does my community look like this? Why are we functioning this way compared to other neighborhoods, other mm-hmm. communities? And I thought it wasn't really fair, and I was trying to figure out why was this the case. And then I realized there were people in charge. <laughs> um, and they were selected by the community. And that sounded kind of like a oh, on, a concept of democracy was amazing to me, right? But, <laughs> um, but as I grew older, I learned that, to my great, great disappointment, that the people making the decisions, like turnout, right, participation was so much lower in communities that you would think would need even a larger voice. Yes. Right? Um, and so that didn't make sense to me. 
Okay. Yeah. Stuck in my gut. I wanted to figure out why in the world that was the case. Mm-hmm. Um, why communities weren't going to their city council or board supervisors or whatever the, whatever the power or kind of arrangement was. If they even knew what it was. Well, like that, <laughs> right? Uh, why did we see? So what was going on? I knew that it wasn't because people didn't care about the communities. Yeah. I knew that wasn't the case, right? Yeah. It wasn't. They weren't to blame. There was something going on. And so mm-hmm. I, as I you know, went to school, I admit uh, poli sci and sociology. Yeah. I'm actually a political sociologist at combined the chin, but but my degree That's so cool. <laughs> my degree is in sociology. Um and uh and I you know I learned all the kind of reasons why I could research that we understand it to the so at least till today. Yeah. Um but it didn't really solve that yeah. gut feeling, you know. <laughs> it's still not fair. <laughs> uh, it's still not fair. It's still a grave concern. There are grave consequences, right, yeah. in terms of um Real life chances, right? That yeah. communities have, and and everyone. I argue mm-hmm. that it's in, you know having a representative democracy is good for every element of our country because again we want our elected officials to have the whole set of ideas, right? They want to need as much information as possible yeah. to make those hard decisions, to make to you know to allocate appropriately, um, to meet the needs of communities. And when they're only looking at a subset, they're going to often get the policies wrong. Exactly. Right? Not just detrimental to some communities, it can be detrimental to everyone. People don't quite understand that as we think about politics as a zero sum game. Yeah, it's like you win, you know, you yeah. lose, whatever, but it's not yeah. that simple. <laughs> yeah. So, so, um, did I think when I was a kid that I was going to go on to get my PhD and be an academic? Nobody <laughs> thinks they're going to grow up to be an academic. Well, maybe some people, well, maybe, maybe, maybe some people maybe. on listening, I shouldn't say that. Well, I, I used to want to be an English professor, and oh, here we are. So, <laughs> that's pretty cool. Um, <laughs> Well, at least there's like movies of like cool English professors, I would argue. Yeah, but <laughs> I don't know. Volcanoes have been a little more fun, I think. I, but but I, it means I get to talk to people like you yeah, now. So. I, I can't think of a good movie that where the main character or any character is a sociologist or political scientist. In you hear this, filmmakers? <laughs> <You know? laughs> so, anyway, I might be missing something. If so, I, I need to know this, these movies. Um, anyway, so, um, but... When I when I got to school, I think I I quickly realized that I had an interest in doing research, and I thought, well, are, there's so many different ways that you can contribute. Yeah. Um, and there's so many different ways that I, I was interested in contributing. But maybe if I was fortunate enough to have um, interest and some talent, in, if people would tell me in research, that maybe that could be my contribution because so many people couldn't mm-hmm. couldn't get to do that or wouldn't yeah. want to do that or whatever. So that would be my 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 kind of slice of the puzzle. Yeah. Um, and then just my form of research, you know, starting my research center is just to make sure that our, you know, we can't look at everything. So mm-hmm. to really focus the the research questions that we do pursue are questions that are going to be um, impactful, consequential, mm-hmm. they answer needs and interests on the ground mm-hmm. as much as possible. And that's the Center for Inclusive that's Democracy. The Center for Inclusive, I guess I should plug in my <laughs> about that. That's the Center for Inclusive Democracy at the USC Bright School. Of public policy, yeah. um, and uh, and in that work, we just disseminate it as widely as possible. The council makers, election officials, advocacy groups, nonpartisan, and everything that we do, we hope we we talk to everybody, we answer questions for where getting is great, hope to engage everybody, um, and it's the power of data, mm-hmm. you know, um, research and data tools. So hopefully, I answered your question. No, that was great. That was great. And and, and I think what fuels me is that yeah. again, that gut feeling is still there. I feel driven. Really, as many people do in this field. I'm not the only one, but I feel driven still to do the work. Yeah, it's my life's work. That's um, great. Yeah, so it's personal. It's it's not just oh, I should do this for society, but you have that need to to make this, you know, a mission. <laughs> yeah, you, you know, it's it's a it's kind of an odd thing for an academic, right? Um, as I know you, you know, you know, yeah. um, across the, uh, so almost all fields. Um, for an academic to talk about their work at a personal level, right? Because we are really trained to be um, not advocates, certainly, mm-hmm. but trained to be impartial, um, independent. And I am impartial, independent in my research. I think we have done a disservice to academics, right? Um, and again, I know there's different service fields, but generally speaking, done a, done a disservice because um, there's always there's always something that drives somebody to get mm-hmm. into academia. And then we have to kind of walk it away, right? <laughs> right. Um, and then that is what informs choices that you make and what you research and who you talk to. And so it is important. The background yeah. is, it does matter. It, it does matter. And especially if you want to do any type of applied research or research, mm-hmm. or apply your research in any sort of way, um, 
it's so it can be so hard to do that work, yeah. right? And to juggle all the the communications around it and keep nonpartisan and to keep fair. Mm-hmm. Um, that you either have to completely lock all of that out, yeah, or you embrace and be open about who you are and what drives your work. But you be but that that allows you to be completely transparent, right? right. So, um, you know, we tell folks the goal of our center is to improve the quality of life, the economic and social quality of life in communities through this research. Right. We don't do on the ground work. Yeah. People can take their research and do it in any way that makes sense for them in their communities, right? And makes sense and people have taken research and used it in different ways, right? In the same community. Um, but I, I think that there's a, a lot of value in being really open and transparent about why you do your work. Yeah. You also can help motivate others to be academic that might have felt like, oh, that's not for me because I want to fight the fight over here. But no, there's ways that academics can contribute to whatever they see us. Yeah. And if the people in academia are only from one specific background, you get the same results, essentially. Well, and, and that's, I'm like, glad you mentioned that. That's a big part of it, too, because I, I think that um, what I've noticed through my career is that people that that are going to be probably more likely to want to do any sort of applied research, but at least work with communities to be public you know, in their work and in their research, um, and that includes policymakers, elected officials, right, other leaders, um, that you're, you're, something is usually driving. I think you're more likely to be driven by wanting to give back to your community, to, 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 to have a sense of responsibility to your community. And generally speaking, academia is really designed to to dissuade us, right? To mm-hmm. disincentivize us That's right, from doing any of that work. Because just by definition, you get done once you're a PhD, and if you're lucky enough, you go on the national job market yeah. to get a job that's going to be take you away from your yeah. community. Um, and when I started my center, actually, initially, for eight years, was called the California Civic Engagement Project. Mm-hmm. I started a center that I wouldn't even, couldn't even for a moment think about moving out of California because I my center was designed to help inform Right, the work and conversation and make an impact in California. Right. Um, but but I think one of the reasons why we have the deep diversity issues that we have, uh, not the only one, but deep diversity issues that we have in academia is that the incentive structures, of course, and I'm, I'm not saying anything most of us don't already know, but particularly on this note, the incentive structures really discourage people who, who want to have an impact. Yeah. who want to give to their communities, whatever geographic, geographic level that is, mm-hmm. um, because we're told that that work is not as valuable, that work should not be discussed, or and or maybe it's embraced. Yeah. Um, but the reality is you're still going to go out, maybe your institution embraces it, but <laughs> then you're going to go out on the national job market and you're going to be taken away from your communities, right? And so um, there's all sorts of reasons why we, of course, have that structure, but there's huge impacts to it. So what I had to do is I just made my own path. Yeah. Um, and, um, I mean, that is that is so rare, but the, that's what makes change is when people say, I'm going to do this and I have to do it my way. There's literally no other way I can make this work. Yeah. Uh, for me, um, starting my center, I felt compelled to start the center period. Like there was no waiting until I got tenure. And, <laughs> I had wonderfully well and uh I had I had faculty and colleagues that really had my back that told yeah. me what the heck are you doing? <laughs> wait till you go on the market. Wait till you go on the market. Wait you get tenure. Wait you do all these things. And you know, foolishly or otherwise at the time, depending on how you want to engage it, I think it makes sense. Um, I, I I just felt compelled that there was there's a need. There's a need, yeah. and in some way we could help. Yeah. Um, we shouldn't be the only one, and aren't the only ones, but in some way we could help. Um, and I felt that it's a responsibility to start my tenure small as it has um and then you know it, and then you just you you have to make once you do that you put a kind of a flag down and then you realize you're kind of going in a different path in a different direction wow. um but i have no regrets because um you know it's where i get i'm lucky to get to do this work yeah. but i am very concerned that of course it took me working outside the war and and yeah. having to not listen to a whole bunch of people who had the back. <laughs> yeah i mean um, sometimes you have to go with your gut and uh and you did and i mean it's it's actually pretty inspiring i think because i'm sure that we have a listener base that's largely scientists or people who really like science in all of its forms and a lot of those folks i mean you don't do science well 
by staying within the guardrails. It's by breaking things and going, oh, that didn't work. Um, now what can I do better or differently? Or what did I learn? And that that is how you know you make change through experimentation. And you did an experiment, and here we are. <laughs> so, um, yeah. so it's it's going well in that regard. And you're at this point in history. So, I mean, just because you have this kind of this lengthy experience around voting and and what patterns look like, I wanted to ask if you've seen a shift in priorities uh, for voters. And like, for example, have you seen environmental concerns as an issue that's um, driving people to the polls in a way that it hasn't? Um, or are there any other major issue shifts that we should be aware of? Yeah, I'll, first off, I'll say that any given poll, generally speaking, the top five uh, top issues that people are concerned about, mm -hmm. especially tying to an election, right? Um, are, are going to be the same. Typically, they're the same. If the numbers adjust a little bit, right? Okay. You know, it's the economy, it's jobs, it's crime, right? Those sorts of things. Health, um, and across groups. Like I get asked a lot about, you know, what Black voters or Latino voters, young voters, are looking at. Um, across groups, people have more in common than they don't have in common, right? So typically, the top interests, right, are going to be very are, are going to be fully somewhat similar. It's shocking, but it shouldn't be. <laughs> it, 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 um, yeah, I mean, and I say that only because. So often I will see it used as an excuse. Well, Latinos or young people care or whatever the group is, they care about this over here and the policymakers can't, you know, be everything to everybody. Mm -hmm. And we're just going to focus on what the mass, mass, you know, public wants or whatever. Um, but really there's a ton of overlap, right? And it should be because everybody cares about all of those issues. Um, we do see some issues, right? Um, where maybe the ranking might be different or the, uh -huh. or the percentages might be different of certainly, um, uh, the time and context matter a lot. So okay. for Latinos, generally speaking, um, you know, uh, issues around immigration mm -hmm. can often be cited um, more, much more than other groups. Um, you can argue, depending on some of that work, how much that drives voting decisions. Mm -hmm. um, uh, sometimes it's used as a way to just uh, better understand candidate and, and their level of uh, friendliness or perceived mm -hmm. threat and that sort of thing, right? Their position on immigration. So that gets kind of complicated, but certainly I just want to acknowledge that um, mm -hmm. positions on immigration are important to many, many Latinos. Um, Latinos are not a monolith, of course. Um, for young people, we've seen shifts um, certainly recently. Um, young people will be more likely than older groups to cite um, environmental issues, social okay. justice issues. Yeah. Um, abortion, obviously, in the last mm -hmm. few years has oh, yeah. come up, um, cited more and more by groups. Um, depending on how the question is worded, you'll <laughs> see that have pop into a, a reason that can't drive something's vote. Okay. Um, so, but I just wanted to emphasize that there's just, while, we're, while there are shifts, there's more more common ground. Okay. And um, why? Is, is the single issue voter a myth or not? <laughs> oh, they're always single issue. Okay. The okay. question is just how many and can they impact the election? That's at least what most people are interested in, yeah. right? When I get a media call, it's, you know, um, Currently, right, yeah. um, the Israeli mm. Hamas right war, and 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 it's been a lot of conversation around how young people are reacting to that. For instance, I've got a lot of questions about, you know, will this shift how young people vote? So that's an example, right, of, of the questions mm. around that. Um, uh, what I have found, at least, I think for most people, um, it's it, I'm not talking about that particular issue. You are right, just speaking. Mm -hmm. um, a single, there's, there's other predictors of why they're going to vote. Okay. So they may be really thinking about when they vote that issue. Uh-huh. But in terms of predicting whether they're going to vote or not, or what type of candidate they vote for, you know, oftentimes, so it's like, okay, they're going to vote Democrat. Democrat. Right? Kind right. of thing. Yeah. So, um, so oftentimes there, there's just other predictors. And so how much you can really kind of blame or cite or credit that issue one single thing, yeah. It, it, it depends. And then a okay. thing shift over the election cycle. And what I, where I, where I think kind of maybe the potentially larger impact Ooh. is just how those issues are used to mobilize people. Mm -hmm. You might say, well, what's the difference? What I mean is that, again, going back to what we talked about before, that so many people are not getting any sort of you know, mobilization, mm -hmm. right, or contact from candidates. Um, mobilization outreach matters. And um, sometimes it's the group that is... Um, is mobilized around an issue that's out fighting to change people's minds, right? Like on abortion or environmental issues, whatever uh -huh. it is. They're out there doing that work. You get connected, right? You get a call from that group, yes, right? And you, they have reason to believe that you're going to be supportive of that issue. Mm -hmm. But maybe the fact that 
that group contacted you, period, right, and yeah. told you about that issue, is that, does that make sense? Which came first, the chicken or the egg? In, in a sense, right? <laughs> um, uh, often people will talk about like, um, does a, does a, you know, does a, does a particular group care about this government, you know, gubernatorial candidate, yeah. or whatever it might be, whatever, right? Do I get this in California? I'm like, what, do, does the Latino community, right? It's like a Samoa. Yeah. Um, <laughs> Which is so, most so, definitely so not. Gavin yeah. Newsom or whatever it might be, mm -hmm. right? Or if there's a, like in the Senate race, right? That's yes. happening now, right? Where does that kind of play out, right? In terms of one group support or another or whatever. Um, and I'll talk about kind of leadership, mm -hmm. um, taking a, Taking a stand in terms of endorsements okay. or nonprofit groups um, entering into a race, mm -hmm. right, in the community to get the word out, right, for a particular candidate, and it sometimes doesn't necessarily. I mean, it's not, it, it's both, but maybe it's less about whether young people or Latinos or Blacks or Asian, you know, whatever the communities that we're talking about are for or against or how much they're for a particular candidate, as it can be even more, that's important, but it can be even more consequential if the leadership in, in a community decides they want to get engaged, mm. those volunteers, right, all that kind of stuff that are out, right, yeah. pressing the flesh or- Boots on the ground. Or, yeah, or, or the yeah, texting, you know, and all that stuff too. Yeah. Um, that commitment can actually, right, be, it, the touch, mm -hmm. right, can actually be more consequential than necessarily even where the person started before they made that touch. Yeah. In terms of their support for a candidate. Does that make sense? It does. And it's actually a really interesting way to consider it. Uh, it's it's not just, oh, so-and-so has their mind made up about issue X and that's the way they're always going to be. But it's, are they going to vote? Yeah. And it's like, no, the thing that activates them to vote is what's really interesting, I Somebody think. Somebody that talks to them and says, yeah. yeah. And they may be like, maybe the first talk, right? The first touch might be like, well, yeah, I care about that, but I... I'm not going to vote. I yeah. don't know. Like, what does this matter, right? In the making the case for voting. Because mm -hmm. um, people will say, oh, it doesn't change anything. Or, oh, I mean, I've heard it all, uh, as I'm sure you have, even more than I have. Um, but it is it is definitely a hurdle that we're having to deal with, is, is kind of unwinding that. Where does it start? What keeps people going to the polls? And kind of along that motivation of people voting, um, I wanted to highlight how in the last few election cycles, um, we've seen a lot of Republican leadership um, everywhere from local to national level um, undermining public trust in vote by mail and early voting. Uh, and I just heard, I think it was yesterday, a segment on NPR about how now Republican leadership is trying to completely do a 180 and say, we have to play, and I'm quoting actually from this piece, we have to play the game of the Democrats. And so you need to go out and vote by mail and vote early. Um, so how do you think that partisan polarization around early voting and mail-in voting might play out in this election cycle? Well, and I know you know this, of course, Republicans used to promote vote by mail all the time. Yes. <laughs> so um, somebody saying we need to now play the game really sounds like to me a way of justifying getting back to it. Yes. You know, because of the inconsistencies and because of the push from Donald Trump and others, right, um, to discourage people in 2020 from, from voting by mail. Like, how, how, do you, how do you get people back? Because Republicans know, strategists know that they, this is a detriment, right? Um, yes, how do you get people put, back to it? How do you justify yeah. it? Maybe you say, you know. Can you put so, the horse back in the barn? Can you put the horse back in the barn? <laughs> so, um, so in, you know, and this is obviously a nonpartisan conversation, but the truth is that we, we know across the country that um, the negative um, uh, conversation and kind of uh, fueling kind of distrust a vote by mail did come from the Republican side and largely pushed by the president uh, of the United States at the time, Donald Trump in 2020, yeah. um, and by others. Um, and that was a surprise. I could not believe that because you just, you cut out the legs of many people's efforts to vote. <laughs> yeah. Your own party even. <laughs> yeah. Um, and so I think your, your question was just... Like, what do you think might happen with this? Because it's so, it's so bizarre to see them... They went this way, now they're going back this way. Right. Uh, you know. <laughs> yeah, you know, it, I will say that I think that we will get back to, or I don't know if we'll ever get to the 2020 numbers that we saw because mm -hmm. that was fueled by a pandemic. What by millions, I should say, right? 2020. Right. Um, but prior to 2020, so we saw a number of states going universal vote by mail. California now, mm -hmm. everybody automatically gets a mail to vote by mail ballot, although they do have options to still vote in person and get their ballot in in different ways, not necessarily through the mail. Um, but I, I think it's, it's one of the big questions is, 
what's it going to look like in two election cycles, three election cycles, four election cycles? Will we see an overall trajectory, upward trajectory of vote by mail, or have the, has this been kind of truncated? Right, 2022 vote by mail just went way down. We expected right. that. Question was just how much. Um, will we see kind of an increasing uh, use over time, or has what happened in 2020, and to some degree, you know, obviously continuing, has that kind of impacted the yeah. long-term trajectory? I, I think it has. Yeah. Um, uh, it may be slowed us down. You know, some states where the conversations were relatively benign, mm-hmm. they're certainly, at least at this point, not benign anymore. <laughs> right. right. Um, we saw a lot of attempts, uh, uh, hundreds of attempts, right, at the state level post-2020 um, to changing election policy. A lot of that was around vote-by-mail access. A lot of that didn't get passed. Some of it did. Yeah. Um, but ultimately, Paul, what I was going to say right off the bat is, you know, it's about politics and winning and re- with Republican and or Democratic strategists, if they think that this is going to help them, mm-hmm. you know, they're going to get back to it, right, in terms of promoting mm-hmm. it. The question is, what's the difference between how the public feels <laughs> and, and and how campaigns and candidates and political strategists feel about it? Um, with Donald Trump in the in the mix, that makes it a little bit harder and he's obviously going to be, he is in the running, mix. He's in the mix. Here we are. <laughs> uh, I can't say going to be, we started. Um, so uh, we'll have to we'll have to see what yeah. the what the long term kind of situation is. But, but you and the Center for Inclusive Democracy will be monitoring it quite closely. I bet um, <laughs> we've done all, we've done a lot of research around vote by mail. Um, uh, I saw one of the papers. That's why I brought it up. Yes, um, <laughs> one paper that was not a CID report, mm-hmm. but was a, a paper academic paper with my colleague Eric McGee, Eric McGee of the Public Policy Institute. It was really right out the gates post twenty twenty. We were looking at this question around turnout. Okay. And if it just for trying to answer one question in this bigger set of questions around the possible negative or disproportionately um, negative or positive impacts of vote by mail right, politically. Um, and in that paper, we found that vote by mail, um, it, it, a universal type of vote by mail, mm-hmm. right? Because you can have um, optional. And, yeah, yeah, like you, do fill, you have to have an excuse, you have to fill out a form, mm-hmm. all that kind of stuff. Did positively impact turn up by a few percentage points, which is that's no. great. Yeah. <laughs> um, but did it have a party advantage? Oh, okay. And we did not find a party advantage. Oh, see, listen up. Um, <laughs> listen up, everyone. And, and there's been a few other um, great work, uh, pieces of uh, academic research that have come out since. But, yeah. uh, you know, there's there's not a party advantage that, that uh, any to any significant degree that has been found. And yeah, it's not a game. It just it's a fact that if you give people vote by mail as an option, they're going to vote more. <laughs> yes, it should be about opening up access yeah. right to voters. Period, regardless of party affiliation, making it easier for people in a pandemic in a non-pandemic mm-hmm. year. Um, so we'll we'll see how things go. There's still a question mark in terms of people's behavior versus yeah. what campaigns do. Yeah, of course. Yeah. There's a couple um, of them, yeah. Oh my gosh. Okay, so I you did mention older voters and younger voters earlier. Um, and then I should say, of course, policy. Oh, yes. Yes, the campaigns can do whatever they want, but if the state house has expanded or contracted vote by mail. Yes. Right, yes. So there's that, three, three, uh, gotta add that. three legs to that stool, maybe, or whatever yes. you want to use. Yes, there we go. I like that three legs to that stool. It's a, I haven't heard that one in a while, but it's a good one. Um, okay, so yeah, I did want to go back to the voting imbalance between Please. older people and young people. Yeah. Um, and, and so what are the consequences that we see of that imbalance in the participation? Like, what are the... The relative numbers of, of young people versus old people who vote. Yeah, so if you look at just standard age groups, right, 18 to 24, uh, 25 to 34, 35 to 44, right, all the way up to like 65 plus, right, mm-hmm. um, in any given election, young voters are going to vote much, much lower rate than older voters. Okay. 20, 30, 40 percentage points, um, less than senior citizens, Yikes. depending if you have higher, you know, it's relative, yeah. right, depending on how big turnout was overall. Um, and I'll give you a shocking number. This is in 2014 when we had here in California statewide election, we had a record low turnout. Oh, okay. Um, only 31% of eligible voters actually turned out at the polls. Oh, people who are watching, not watching on video, if they're just listening on the podcast, my jaw was dropping yes. there. And that was a general election. Oh, um, and you might expect that, unfortunately, maybe in a primary. That's a general election. Um, guess what the turnout rate was for 18 to 24 year olds eligible? So this is not oh, registered. This is the share, the percentage of 
eligible 18 to 24 year old adult citizens yeah. right, turned out. For the population as a whole, I'm giving you some barometer. Okay. 31% okay. for the population. For everyone. For oh all ages God. that are eligible. Oh my God. It's going to be abysmal, isn't it? Um, I don't know, like 15%, 20%? Yeah. Very optimistic. Oh, no. It's lower than that? 8.2%. Uh, the silence is me being shocked. And the number is much lower, and this is important. Wow. For young people of color. Oh, um, I bet. I bet it's, oh my gosh. What yeah. was the percent there? Do you know? Uh, we didn't report that because the okay. reliability at that level. It's um, it's yeah, hard. it's really, but. Yeah, but it, yeah I'm sure. I'm sure. It really, really does. And actually, that was the other thing I was going to ask is, do you see that imbalance exaggerated with voters of color? So. Across the age range, uh, across yeah. yeah. So if we look just by race ethnicity, we mm-hmm. see big gaps yeah, um, as right. well, depending on the election cycle. Um, twenty, you know, ten to twenty to thirty percentage points, we'll say between the general population mm-hmm. and Latinos and Asian Americans. Wow. Yeah. Um, black numbers um, can vary a little bit more up and down a little bit depending on the type of election. Bigger gaps yeah. in primaries and midterm years. Smaller gaps. Okay. Um, when it's a presidential year, mm. it's in recent election cycles. <laughs> um, but still disparity, right? And mm. underrepresentation. So, you know, uh, when we talk about, so I just gave you that, you know, a really dramatic number, but, <laughs> and then watch what I say. However, we have to be careful when we when we talk about these numbers. And I had to be really careful when I put out that research brief. It was a number that. Uh, at least in you know election circles and research circles, it just kind of reverberated around the state. Like there oh. were a lot of news yeah. media around with it. Mm-hmm. It was just so shocking. I gave presentation after presentation. I would ask people what they thought it was. I put the number up there, and like the whole world would gasp. Right, <laughs> right. Um, but I had to be really careful because I wanted to get. I wanted people to know. Yeah, yeah. That's yeah. what we do with our it's research, important. <laughs> right? Um, but you, this is where doing public research, right, kind of kicks in, right? Yeah. The difference. So. I wanted to make sure, though, at the same time, if at all possible, people didn't walk away with, oh, well, there's nothing we can do. Exactly. Right? Can't do that. Yeah. Um, you know, is it throwing good money after bad? Mm-hmm. Campaigns already use likely voter models that don't, you know, are just going to reinforce that. Well, government efforts, right? If they're potentially investing in elections, mm-hmm. well, they say, well, forget about young people, right? Uh-huh. Um, what will the narrative be? Will we reinforce the, oh, those kids just don't vote? Mm-hmm. You know, maybe it's better, you know, uh-huh. if they don't care. Well, uh-huh. should we try to, should we want to pull them in when, look, they're not voting on their own? You know, that kind but of thing. But it's like, but why aren't they voting? Yes. Oh, in fact, you got to fix so, that. <laughs> you know, there is a lot. Uh, for researchers that we have to be careful or, well depending exactly where you where you're coming from as an academic <laughs> um, you know you're not trying to create the policy but mm-hmm. you want to be responsible as much as possible with how people take in the data yeah. right and so at the same time I would make sure that in every presentation I talk through all the reasons why these numbers are likely the way they are mm-hmm. right um, and to talk about the barriers for young people Right and participating, so it isn't oh, those kids. What's wrong with them? It's <laughs> oh, maybe we should be thinking about how the system right isn't supporting young people. What generated these numbers? And then also, um, I think getting part of your, getting part of your question, the, just the impacts of that. So what does it matter? Yeah. Right, if it's eight point two percent, or in another, another election, seventeen point five percent, or you know, what does it matter? And what would it look like if it was 100%? Yes, um, <laughs> exactly. Yeah. And, and youth are actually 18 to 24 are more numerous than like 60, at least in California, um, 65 to 74 year olds. Okay. So if young people voted at the same rates as older voters, and we eliminated the disparities, young people actually be a larger share of the pie of voters that was casting a ballot. Wow. Right. In, in the election, the math works out. Yeah. So if you just look what, what causes underrepresentation. So you hear about you know 14 or so percent of the eligible voter population in California when they have much lower turnout rates when there's a disparity gap right in turnout rates with older voters it means that they are underrepresented at, at the ballot box so their smaller share of the pie of voters in any given election mm-hmm. than their share of eligible voters right so okay if I remember correctly in that election where they had 8.2 percent eligible turnout mm-hmm. they were like 3.1 three percent of the voting electorate, those casting a ballot. Okay. But they were 14% of the eligible voter population, but only 3%. Mm-hmm. Does that make sense? Yeah. The representation of the ballot box. So right. literally, they are not getting to have a significant say in all of the elections, local and statewide, in that election. Ongoing, it's always, there's always big disparities. It just 
the question again is just how much, yeah. but they're always significant. These are always underrepresented at the ballot box, mm. right? They're always a smaller share of actual pie of voters, again, whether it's bigger or little pie, um, versus their share of the electorate. So they are, so the obvious thing is that they're just not getting, and this is the case for all underrepresented groups, right? Mm. They're not getting to select at rates that are, you would think they're kind of fair, right? You know, yeah. they should have a, if you're fully represented at the ballot box, your share of the vote should be about your share of the eligible voter population. So they're not getting to select all of those things that are on the ballot. Yeah. Um, but it also has consequences, like we talked earlier, about this vicious cycle when it comes to mobilization and outreach. Yeah. And so campaigns and candidates are not doing that outreach to young people that are not being picked up in the likely voter model. Who does that outreach? It's the nonprofit, nonpartisan mm-hmm. groups, you know, yeah. voting rights groups that are local that are really fighting an uphill battle because we don't, because the overall landscape in, in the US um, in terms of outreach and mobilization shows us that it's the campaigns and candidates that do the vast majority of that work. Yeah. Um, it means that kind of everybody else, so there's an inequitable landscape, sorry, I'm not sure what's the word, an inequitable landscape in okay. terms of outreach. So everyone else that might want to enter in and help out, mm-hmm. right? Um, and mobilize are really fighting an uphill battle yeah. to begin with, right? So, um, so then you have this vicious cycle that continues at the ballot box, um, and then of course, when we want young people to like, when we try to make the case, yeah, you have like it's kind of hard sometimes to make the case. So let's say you've got a lot of outreach happening in the community that's trying to fight that inequitable larger outreach right, mm-hmm. about campaigns and candidates. They they get to a young person, try to make the case, they're doing the long connection, you know, multiple mm-hmm. touches and all that stuff over time. And then they don't have as much to work with because they say, Well, you know, have you looked at the candidates? Yeah. Candidates haven't reached out to them. Yeah. Maybe they've watched a debate. They didn't see any youth specific conversations mm-hmm. right happening. Again, young people care about issues that older voters care about too. Yeah. But the maybe older voter issues like Social Security and Medicare and things like that dominated the conversation, or at least the way that the conversation went was a way that maybe there were some quips in there about how young people and those millennials, right? Yes. Um, the campaigns just aren't geared towards, um, for the most yeah. part, for young people. And so multiple factors come together that you end up having this, um, not only this vicious cycle of young people not participating in, in the rates that they could, yeah. right? But you also have... Um, this dynamic where voting can be habit for me. Mm-hmm. So when we don't, if we got every young person at, when they turn 18 or whenever their first election is to participate, we'd have more young people participating through the life course, right? As you get older, more people just participating through their life course. But what happens is we get only a small percentage of young people voting in any given election. That small percentage, like we talked about earlier, is Dispro- even more so than older age groups, disproportionately not representative of the youth population, right? <laughs> older, right. older, whiter. So you have a really skewed youth pop. We are happy for all youth voters. Yeah. All right. But it is definitely very underrepresented. So youth as a whole underrepresented compared to older voters. But then the youth pie matter. of voters is very underrepresented. You start off with young. Here's the kicker. Yeah. You start off with young people, like a pool of young voters that is underrepresented or non-represented in other youth. And then as they get older, mm-hmm. some people come into the electorate, right? right. Some people are the older age groups have higher turnout rates. Yeah. Um, but you have a very, you continue to have a very unrepresented because the people who are more likely to enter into the electorate are still going to be skewed. Uh, if we somehow could get a more equitable um, distribution of young people, more representative distribution of young people participating, yeah, then we, over time, may actually start to impact some of that lack of representative. That makes so much sense. <laughs> oh my god, that's a long answer. To your no, question. no, it's great. It's so interesting too. I mean, I I could probably talk to you like for three more hours, but we're getting towards the end. But I had one question before my final one, so and, penultimate. <laughs> and, and I should say, of course, that's you know taking out all the kind of extraneous factors that can impact why people do or do not get jump into the electorate. The contextual factors, competitive elections, all this. I'm saying, generally speaking, that's kind of the trajectory. trajectory. So if somebody's into this. They should pursue studying it because there's a lot more work that can be done. There's so much information to consider. So yeah, there you go. go to USC, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> Study with Mindy Romero. <laughs> okay, so I do want to bring it around too because you need a concerned scientist. We um, we we do deal with a lot of things like climate change and green technology. Um, 
But having science and democracy working together is really fundamental to what we do. Yeah. Uh, it's one of our major program areas. So I wanted to ask you, as someone who is a political sociologist and actively doing research and teaching in this, this field, um, what role do you think science has in ensuring that we have fair and equitable representation? Of course, it has a huge role, right? I'm going to say that, but, I, but it's Good. true. Um, <laughs> I like that. Um, you know, in educating policymakers alone, right? Mm -hmm. But educating the public, a better understanding why we have things like turnout disparities, mm -hmm. right? So that way we can hopefully in the long haul address them. Yeah. Um, and see a more representative democracy, numerically representative democracy at least. Um, but, uh, you know, our whole, uh, where do you want to go with this? <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, every field, elections are, are no different. Our democracy space is no different. Um, we need to have facts. Yeah. We need to have research. We need to have those that are uh, have the ability to be able to ask the questions, the research questions that are uh, most relevant. Mm -hmm. Not all researchers have to do that, but but grounded and you know, it's, it's really really critical, especially in the elections policy, the democracy space more broadly. Um, and we need to have people that can communicate yeah. that research out to policymakers mm -hmm. to talk about the impact of vote by mail and other types of election policies like automatic voter registration, pre-registration of young people, vote right. centers. Um, what does it matter from an election administration perspective? What does it matter from a voter experience perspective? What does it matter in the long run from the strength of our democracy in terms of, again, in, you know, uh, robustness and inclu inclusivity? Um, so it's critically important and we need more people in this field and we certainly also need um, even greater ability to be able to communicate. It's gotten more difficult in yeah. the last few <laughs> election cycles to talk about things like election reforms in a way that it isn't going to get taken and run with, right? Yeah. And there's going to be a political attack um, mm -hmm. on the work. Yeah. So if you do research around vote by mail and you say there isn't a partisan, because the data says there's not a partisan benefit, yeah. um, you know, a few election cycles ago, that was probably not very many people were even going to, you know, yeah. aside from hopefully policymakers at least are going to be paying attention to that. Um, and now a lot more people are, are paying attention to election science research. But there's also the potential for uh, crying foul mm -hmm. in terms of partisanism or uh, inappropriate, you know, research design or whatever it might be. And that's the thing that's difficult. Researchers need to ask hard questions. Yeah. We need to be able to communicate that work as a matter of fact, as a given. Um, and so many researchers, I think, sometimes get a little scared off even mm -hmm. in this space. Mm -hmm. There's many that have been entering into this space as well because they see the worlds of it. But I think it also is something that can be intimidating yeah. because of the charged nature of just all of these conversations. <laughs> right. Especially these days when it seems like you're cheering on a football team, not actually engaging in democracy <laughs> and people that don't like the research because the stakes are so high yeah. right the yeah. stakes are so high um and and a lack of kind of um we talk about the norms of our democratic institutions mm -hmm. and people having to believe in you know in them and adhere to them and respect yeah. them uh you know as researchers you start off with most people not really knowing what we do and yeah. you know, the tenets of good research and that sort of thing and um what our, the standards are for an academic that's university based mm -hmm. and that you know you should hope hope that you know we're, we're starting off with some level of trust with the public generally or policymakers right because they know that we have to adhere to certain guidelines mm -hmm. but a lot of people don't know that yeah um and they so think it's all biased or paid for or something I yeah think. so yeah, yeah. It's, it is a challenge but that's i'm just glad that you're like yes it has a big role because uh that's i just want to encourage people um and i've done this for a few years in my own career is just encourage people that yeah scientists need to engage with our democracy we can't sit it out and go well as a scientist i have to be completely impartial to everything no because science is political because who funds it and what is getting funded determines what gets researched and so we need to the scientific method is apolitical but yeah. science itself like if you want a government in place that will fund good science, you got to vote for people who are going to support good science. So well, and you got to vote. <laughs> and, and you know, I mean, I was really referencing, of course, election science research, right? But we're at a public policy school, right? The uh, yeah. School of Public Policy here at USC, and it's really scientists engaging on, on a whole myriad of topics, right? Doing the research and then 
asking policy relevant questions and then in, engaging with policymakers on that research to explain it, you know, to communicate it, to explain it, all that sort of thing. You can have a, a ton of good research that's out there that even gets sent to policymakers. Mm -hmm. But um, uh, taking that step to actually engage with policymakers mm -hmm. is so important. Um, and to build that community, that trust and that communication to create the two pager that's going to be much easier for the staff member, right? To, <laughs> yes. to, to read through and then hopefully also then read the full uh, report. Um, yes, yeah, so uh, whatever the, the research field is, engaging with public policymakers is so incredibly important. And if we don't do it as academics, other people will come along and fill that void. That's very true. Or, <laughs> or um, policy gets made without any real <laughs> data or facts. Um, and unfortunately, that does happen too. Yeah, evidence based policy making is pretty much my love language. So, <laughs> <laughs> yes. Um, uh, evidence based uh, bill creation uh, um, and, you know, and voting on bills. Um, yeah. You know, That'd uh, be nice to have, wouldn't it? It'd be nice to have. <laughs> Um, yeah, so, see it. <laughs> well, so, okay, for, for how we kind of like to tie things up here at yeah. uh, This Is Science is uh, we are the Union of Concerned Scientists, yes. and my final question to all of my guests is the same, and so it is for you. Mindy, why are you concerned? I am concerned about a lot of things, but um, it is <laughs> 2024, and we just uh, flipped the calendar, right, and we're uh, just started uh, in earnest the... Uh, primary, caucus primary season, um, it's going to be a bumpy ride. Mm. And uh, for all the reasons why I think probably most of your listeners are already thinking, right? Misinformation, disinformation, um, political rhetoric, trust, um, threats of election officials, the list goes on and on. Um, I'm particularly concerned about AI. Mm. I, I fear that it will actually be probably the story of 2024, other than who gets elected. Yeah. <laughs> um, and and its role in the public's belief and trust in the outcome of the election. Mm. Um, and of course, right here, I'm focusing on the presidential election, but we could be yeah. talking about local as well, state or local. Um, and, it, it, you know, if we have a close election either way, I think we're going to be, um, you know, facing some real challenges in terms of the strength of our democratic institutions. Um, I'm not the only one to say that, obviously, but I'm, I'm deeply concerned. I, I'll add something to it, though. Okay. What we don't talk enough about. Um, so much of the conversation over the last few years, and now going into 2024, good people, uh, academics, policymakers, others, right, um, leading thinkers um, in the democracy space, Come together to talk about things like cybersecurity, mm -hmm. like misinformation and disinformation, right? Yeah. Trust in elections and so forth. All really important critical conversations. What do we do? <laughs> how do we save it off? Right? How do we save our democracy? <laughs> but so many of those conversations don't talk about what we've talked about, you and I, yeah. most of this conversation, which is the equity mm -hmm. component, right? An inclusive, equitable um, election system, an inclusive democracy. Yeah. Um, and I think um, we don't talk enough about just the disparate right, impacts or differential impacts on different communities when we talk about trust, yeah. when we talk about misinformation. We're, we're not, you know, as, as we do in so many other types of topics, we're, we're just not considering um, those types of things. But particularly here, what I'm concerned about um, is for a very long time, we've had a lot of good people, a lot of leaders in our country, a lot of civil rights groups, voting mm -hmm. rights groups, that have really pushed us to get to be a more representative democracy, right? Yeah. To fulfill the promise of our democracy. And a lot of that conversation is pushing back on the fact, you know, calling out the, the, uh, the, uh, the, the ills and the, the deficiencies in our democracy and the fact that we're not there, right, and, and so forth. And now, in the last couple of election cycles, um, there is so, there's so much conversation around trying to save mm -hmm. our democracy yes. um, and save our institutions that it's a lot of that, in some way, shape, or form, kind of reassuring people. No, everything's okay. There's not any fraud, right? Everything's and and 2020 election was incredibly well run, and with yeah. you know the 
uh, no election was stolen, right? And, mm-hmm. and uh, with between, you know, certainly in talking at the presidential level, um, there was not the, the, the big lie is a big lie, and all of that and everything, <laughs> right? It's been, you know, it's, it's been, our legal system has shown us that for sure. If you doubted it, um, but um, there's there's been so much conversation around kind of shoring that up, so uh, the people that are conspiracy theorists that do want to attack that, we're trying not to give them anything, mm-hmm. right? Anything to run with. Right. But what that means then is that for everybody who's been fighting that good fight for so long, right, to question our institutions, to make them better, to push them, mm-hmm. right, again, for that promise, you lose, they have lost a lot of allies in that conversation, but also sometimes there's this at best, mm-hmm. and sometimes there's this, Yeah. you know, um, and maybe not so obvious, but... I fear coming out of 2024 that folks that are on one path yeah. to, to, to improve our democracy, they don't want to see us save it or go back to what it was prior to 2016. They want to see it continue to evolve to a stronger, right, yeah. better democracy. And what will it look like post-2024? What does it look like now um, in those different conversations Mm -hmm. and can will we potentially find ourselves coming out of this we hope coming out of this in some way um with out uh less uh ability less capacity for coalition work Mm. to continue to push for a better democracy well you know will that just be harder when people kind of look to see where people lined up where it shouldn't be about lining up right but um some folks are focused on this, and some folks are focused on that, and some folks are focused on this. And at times, some groups may be feeling that their voices are not being heard or being, or funding is going in places where it's not going to them, right? And, mm-hmm. and their fight that, they're, they're, that they've been fighting. So I've just, you asked me what I'm concerned about. I'm concerned about what everybody's concerned about. And I'm also thinking about things like that and yeah. what that means for the, the continued improvement of our democracy. You think about just the converse, how the conversations have changed, right? From the honest conversations about where we're at, uh, have just become more difficult. I think in many, many places and in many circumstances. Wonderful answer, and thank you so much for talking with me and for doing the work that you're doing. It is absolutely essential, even even more now than it was a couple of years ago, if, I, if that's even possible <laughs> to say. But I'd say um, keep up the good work, and uh, I hope you get a lot of really awesome people tuned into this stuff now because we're putting it out there. I'd like love to help disseminate what you're doing um, and just promote it because we do need to understand this stuff, and we do need to get everybody in the room. I mean, everyone deserves to be. Thank you. Thank you.